The inspiration for the 1984 comedy Police Academy came from just about the last place you would expect, the multiple Oscar-winning film The Right Stuff. In the early 80s, producer Paul Mislansky was working on The Right Stuff in San Francisco. They were filming a scene, and recruits from the local police academy were there for additional crowd control. The cops arrived in buses, and Mislansky noticed this was one of the most diverse groups of police he had ever seen. He spoke to the sergeant overseeing the group, and he told Mislansky the department had a fair employment hiring practice. They had to take in anyone who applies. He then looked around, leaned in, and said, But we can then flunk them after three weeks. That night, Mislansky was thinking about it and came up with an idea. What if there was a group of misfits in the police academy that were determined to stay? This was the foundation for what would become Police Academy. He wrote a two-page treatment and presented it to Alan Ladd Jr., the head of the Ladd Company, who he was working for at the time. He liked the idea and greenlit the production. A few years earlier, Porky's was a huge hit, and so they decided the movie should be a screwball comedy. The screenplay was written by Neil Israel, who had worked on Tunnel Vision, and Pat Proft, who worked on Police Squad, and was a writer on the Star Wars Holiday Special. They were shopping it around, and the screenplay landed on the desk for the agent, a producer-director, Hugh Wilson. Wilson was the creator and executive producer on WKRP in Cincinnati, and loved the idea. Wilson had just lost out on directing another film, and was looking for something different. He called Ms. Lansky and told him he read the script and would like to direct. He had a few changes in mind, so they met and discussed further. Ms. Lansky liked Wilson's ideas and hired him to direct. They knew they weren't going to have a large budget to work with, so they looked to hire either lesser-known or unknown actors. The most important thing of all, though, was that they each understood comedy. Much like the Police Academy that inspired the story, they wanted it to be a diverse ensemble cast. The film had two casting directors, Pamela Basker and Fern Champion. They both got their start in the industry, casting for the sadly forgotten horror film, Fade to Black. They hired ex-football player Bubba Smith for the role of Moses Hightower. Smith left football in the mid-70s and moved on to acting, where he was often cast due to his enormous size and soft-spoken but menacing demeanor. Wilson loved him and not only cast him in the film, it was his idea to make him a florist. Kim Cattrall was born in Liverpool, England, but shortly after, her family moved to Canada. She had small roles in TV shows like Quincy and movies like Deadly Harvest before gaining a good deal of attention as the character of Lassie in the hit Porky's, which was the fifth highest grossing film of 1982. She was exactly who they were looking for when it came to the character of Karen Thompson, the love interest. The casting directors were looking for a comedian to be in the film, and there was a buzz around a guy named Michael Winslow. Fern and Pamela had seen his act and they told production about him. He was opening for Count Basie in Long Beach, so Ms. Lansky and Wilson went to see him perform. When Winslow went on stage, the audio went out. Without missing a beat, he walked off stage and asked to borrow a megaphone from a fire marshal on site. He then proceeded to do his entire act with the megaphone and brought the house down. Ms. Lansky approached him after the show and cast him that night. They loved his ability to make sound effects so much... <laughs> Wilson went back to the script, and since there wasn't anyone written for him to play, they created the character of Larvel Jones specifically for him. Even though actor G.W. Bailey had been working in the industry since 1975, he already had an extensive career, mostly in TV shows like Flo, MASH, and Sane Elsewhere. He was cast as Lieutenant Harris, the heel for the film. George Gaines was cast as Commander Lassard. He was a classically trained actor who'd been working in the industry since the 50s. They described his character as... Permanently out to lunch, the man who has the least idea of what's going on, but somehow always saves the day. Since Proft had previously worked on Police Squad, he wrote the character of Lassard with Leslie Nielsen in mind. Lassard is an anagram for Lardass. Actor Donovan Scott auditioned for the role of Leslie Barbara. He heard they were looking for somebody who could do physical comedy, which was his background. When he arrived to audition, he purposely flipped head over heels and introduced himself. Wilson was laughing out loud and said, I think you got this. Leslie Easterbrook auditioned for the part of the tough female cop. While waiting, she discovered the part called for a 45-year-old female Wayne Newton, complete with mustache. Her first thought was how she wanted to fire her agent for sending her here. When she went in, she thought she might be able to convince them to go a different way with the character. She auditioned by intentionally intimidating both the director and the producer. With that, she was able to get them on board with the idea of making the character a sexy, domineering cop. They liked her version and hired her for the role. They named her Sergeant Callahan as a parody of Dirty Harry. Marion Ramsey auditioned for the film. 
The role called for a character that was afraid of everything. The voice she uses for the film was her impression of Michael Jackson. Do you know what that means? Hooks. I'm not sure, sir. She once met Jackson after giving a performance for the stage play Little Shop of Horrors. Jackson came backstage and told her how much he liked her singing. Ramsey decided to emulate his soft-spoken voice and use that for the character. David Graff auditioned for the role of Tackleberry in full camouflage gear. Wilson loved him, and after his audition, he closed the casting, saying he didn't need to see anyone else. It was early in Steve Gutenberg's career. He'd been acting for just a few years, and recently finished his biggest film up to that point, Diner. His father was a cop, so he wore his dad's shirt from his time in the police academy to the audition. They loved him. They thought he had the right attitude and charisma for the character of Mahoney. He was a live-action Bugs Bunny, selfish, goofy, and loved to play pranks. They filled out the cast with Bruce Mahler as Fackler, Andrew Rubin as George Martin, Scott Thompson as Copeland, and Brant Von Huffman as Blanks. As a way to save money, they decided to shoot in Canada. They hired Trevor Williams to be the production designer. Williams had made numerous films in Canada, like The Changeling, Lost and Found, and The Silent Partner. They were looking for a location for the police academy, and found an abandoned psychiatric hospital in Etobicoke, Toronto, Canada. The place was huge and cleaned up well. Because of the size of the location, they knew they'd be able to film most of the production here. They had some other places scouted and moved ahead with filming. They planned to shoot for 40 days over the summer of 1983 on a budget of around $4 million. The training montage was filmed at Lake Ontario in the background. For the scene where Barbara gets thrown over a bridge, that was the Cherry Street Bridge in Toronto. Actor Donovan Scott was in the giant photo booth, and the whole thing almost tipped over, which could have been a disaster. There was a problem in the filming schedule for Copeland and Blanks. In the movie, they arrive with full heads of hair, but get buzz cuts. For some reason, they shot the scenes out of order, so the two had their heads shaved, but then had to film themselves arriving in the police academy with all their hair. After realizing this, the costume designer had to have them fitted with wigs, which aren't the most believable, but they worked well enough that most people didn't notice until it was pointed out. For the film, they wanted lots of natural funny stunts. For the scene in the parking lot, they were able to get the stuntman to drive the Trans Am on two wheels. They got the shot with just two takes. For the motorcycle scene, they had Dar Robinson, who broke 19 world stunt records and set 21 world's firsts. His most famous stunt being the 220-foot freefall for the 1981 film Sharky's Machine. The director told the cast he didn't mind improv, but not to push it, to let the script be funny. He also made sure to not get too many takes because the spontaneity and the humor begin to wear down if they do the same lines over and over. When the bad cops are in the Blue Oyster Bar, the director told them to look like Pepe Le Pew's girlfriend. The two bikers in the bar were professional ballroom dancers. Since they were following the Porky's template, they put in some random nudity to make sure the film got an R. This was also to appeal with what they figured would be a mostly male demographic. For the training montage, Bubba Smith could barely run because he blew out his knees after years of football. So for his scenes, he's mostly walking. While working on the film, the crew told Wilson about the time when many of them worked with director Michael Winner. Winner was using a megaphone on the film and was being insufferable. They decided to play a prank on him by putting shoe polish on the mouthpiece. Wilson liked the idea so much, he put it in the film as one of the pranks Mahoney played on Harris. When shooting the bathroom scene, they didn't have anything to end on. Wilson told Winslow to just do something funny, and so he improv the scene with the razor coming alive and attacking him. They had a few cameos and inside jokes in the film. Wilson has a cameo in the film as Angry Man in Jacket. Wilson's pregnant wife is in the crowd. Ms. Lansky's baloney truck is named after the producer. The bullies that bother Barbara throughout the film were the stuntmen. While working on the film, they knew the biggest laugh would be when Commander Lassard accidentally gets a blowjob. They knew they had to play this right or it wouldn't work. They also had to convince the actor, as he had never done something like this before. Wilson knew this was going to be the make-or-break moment in the film, especially when Lassard thinks it was Mahoney. The hooker in the film was Georgina Spelvin, who ten years earlier starred as Justine Jones in the adult film The Devil and Miss Jones. Towards the end of the film, there was supposed to be a riot in a bad neighborhood. The problem was, they were shooting in Toronto and couldn't find a rough enough looking place to film. Finally, they found one that worked well enough, and they were able to add some additional props to dirty it up to look like the bad part of town. They finished filming and moved into post. While editing the picture, they weren't happy with the end. Executive producer Alan Ladd Jr. thought they needed to go out on a bigger laugh. He suggested that Lassard get revenge on Mahoney, so they reshot an insert where Mahoney is giving a speech, 
and the prostitute is under the podium. The film had an opening at Grumman's Chinese Theater. Many of the cast went. Gutenberg went to see the film with his agent. Afterwards, they were walking out, and his agent was in a panic. He said, I'm putting you in a TV series immediately. This movie is going to be the biggest bomb in film history. Roger Ebert gave the film zero stars. He called it one of the least funny movies he had ever seen. He said, If there's anything worse than a punchline that doesn't work, it's a movie that doesn't even bother to put the punchlines in. They were both wrong. The movie opened on March 23, 1984, and was number one at the box office. It held the number one spot for five weeks and grossed over $81 million domestically. It was the sixth highest grossing film of the year. They were afraid of how police officers would feel about the film, but were overjoyed to find that most cops loved it and shared some stories of their own pranks they played while they were at the police academy. Wilson went to see it on opening night, and just as he thought, the audience got the biggest laugh when Lassard sees Mahoney coming out from under the podium. He attributed that scene to being what launched the film into a series. Since this movie was such a hit, they fast-tracked a sequel and were able to get Police Academy 2, their first assignment, in theaters almost a year later. It also opened at number one and spent four weeks in the top spot. Police Academy became a hit bigger than anyone expected. The movie launched the series, which had seven films in total, a live-action TV series, and an animated TV series. They were even working on a video game for the series, but it was cancelled. Despite its popularity, over the years the series became the punchline to many a joke. Why do you think I took in all those Police Academy movies? For fun? Well, I didn't hear anybody laughing! Did you? The later films moved too far away from the initial formula, and the last in the series, Mission to Moscow, was almost given a G rating. Gutenberg stayed for the first four films, but left after that. Michael Winslow, David Graff, and George Gaines were the only actors to appear in all seven movies. Winslow was also in the TV series. Leslie Easterbrook was in an episode as District Attorney Callahan. Even though The Right Stuff won numerous awards, it was a flop at the box office, making only $21 million domestically. Ms. Lansky said the Police Academy earned about as much money as The Right Stuff lost. In 2012, Steve Gutenberg released an autobiography, The Gutenberg Bible. In it, he mentions that actor Donovan Scott made home movies while they were filming and put together a very funny, touching, unreleased documentary about the shoot. Sadly, many of the original team have died over the years. Bubba Smith, George Gaines, Andrew Rubin, David Graff, and director Hugh Wilson. Here we are 34 years after the first Police Academy movie. While the later films really tarnished the series, I think most people forget just how big the first film was. Police Academy is still a very funny comedy. Wilson said the appeal of the movie is that it's not mean. No one gets killed, and the vast majority of violence is cartoonish levels at best. It's an old-fashioned slapstick comedy with lots of heart. On your mark, get set. This group of misfits all comes together in the end to prove themselves and save the day. It's just a big goofy look at one of the largest institutions in the United States. Come on. No! Okay, that's how it's done. Who's next? That's me! I love it! I love it!